In our previous lessons on programming, we reused blocks that were already provided to us in SNAP. In this lesson, we're going to learn how to create our own blocks that we can reuse throughout our program. So it's very important to be able to do this in computer science so that we can practice what we call software reuse. So instead of writing the same software over and over, if we can write it in a very general way, it can be reused in many different contexts. So one of the powers of that is abstraction. So we will talk later about abstraction, but we'll look a little bit in this lesson at procedural abstraction. So procedural abstraction is about using parameters in blocks. So for example, when we use the move block in the motions category and we passed in the length of the movement, that was a parameter to that block. And when we, we, we create our own blocks, we can also add parameters. So it makes these blocks much more reusable. For example, imagine a move block where it just always moved five pixels. That wouldn't be very reusable. So by making that have a parameter, we can specify the length of the move. So another example is instead of having a single square that's 10 pixels long, that wouldn't be very reusable in many contexts. So an improvement would be to draw a square dependent upon the length of the sides that the user specifies. So we can create our own blocks by going to the variables category. At the very bottom, there's a make block itself. So when we click on that, we're presented with a dialog like you see here on the, the bottom of the screen. So there's three kinds of blocks that we can create. There's a command block that performs a set of operations and it does not return any values, but it does allow for certain inputs to be provided as parameters. There's also a reporter, which also takes input parameters if, if needed, and will also return a value of some other type. And a third kind is a predicate. So it's kind of like a reporter, but it will always return a Boolean value of true or false. So when we create our blocks, we can select which kind of block we want. And um, once we created that, it then appears in any of the categories that we select. So we can place our own blocks into any of the, the categories that are at the top. So in our first example here, we're going to draw a square. So what would be an advantage of building our own block that only drew squares? So we're going to explore that idea. We're going to generalize something into a much more reusable block than what we see here. But this particular block on the screen will just draw a square 10 pixels. So you can see this block is named square and it has a, a loop of four times and we're just drawing a line that's 10 pixels and then doing a 90 degree angle and doing that four times and that will then create a square. One way you might do, introduce this to students is instead of using the loop you might uh, go back and look at when we talked about loops and instead draw a square with all those uh, steps done manually with eight different blocks rather than just the two that you see here. So once we have the square created, we can then reuse that. And as you see here on the right side of the screen, we are clearing the canvas, placing the pin down, and then calling square, which will draw the 10 pixel length of square. So if we would like to make our square more generalized, we can add a parameter to it, which would specify the length of the size. So in this case, there are plus signs on either to the left or right of the name of the block, and we can click on either one. In this case, we'll click to the right side, and we will just give the name of a parameter called size. And what you do after entering the parameter is you just drag and drop that size down into the move. So you see I replaced the move 10 pixels with the size parameter that was passed in. So now I can draw a square of arbitrary sizes. So if you look at this screen, I'm calling back in my, my main program here when I click the green flag, I'm drawing two squares, one on top of another. So you can see the two calls to the squares here draw the smaller square and then a larger square on top of it. So I can reuse my square block and draw squ squares of arbitrary size rather than just a square of 10 pixels as we saw previously. So this block is much more reusable. I can draw a square of arbitrary size. When I'm creating parameters with my blocks in Snap, I can also define the type of the parameters, much like how we define the type of variables when we, dis when we discuss the variable section. So when I click on the name and describe the, the particular name of the parameter, I have the option by clicking the right arrow of defining what type I would like my parameters to be. So they can be numeric types, text types, I can even have lists as my parameter types. So let's generalize even further this notion of drawing a shape. So 
Previously, we drew a 10 pixel square. We generalized that to a square of any size pixels. And now we'd like to draw um, any shape. So any number of sides and any specific number of pixels for the size. So sides and size will be the way we'd like to generalize this. So as you can see here, we have a draw any shape block. And if you study this carefully, I think you can see the logic here and how it's much more abstract and more generalized than the previous. So we pulled out the ideas of fixed number of sides and a fixed number of the length of, the, of, of each side. So in this case, you won't see a number four, you won't see for a square, you'll see sides there, and then you'll also see the number of the size of each side. And the way that we turn, the number of degrees, if you think about it, it's 360 divided by the number of sides. So you can see on the screen how we would draw a triangle, um, an octagon, and even a circle. So the very last one that you see is a, a circle where we have 360 sides, and we're just drawing at a very small one pixel at a time side that if we repeat that over and over 360 times we'll get an approximation of a circle. So the idea of abstraction will be discussed in much more detail in later lessons. We even have a reading for you to do on that. But in this case we're looking at the concept of procedural abstraction. So as an example when we use a repeat loop we could write the same kind of loop as a do until, but we would have to keep count of a specific variable that would count the number of loop iterations. So that's kind of abstracted for us when we use the repeat loop. And then as we saw here in this example with the square, I can abstract out some of the essential characteristics of a shape, the number of sides and the size of each side, and make this a much more abstract block that can be reused in many contexts. So with this draw shape block that we saw on the previous slides, I can draw a shape of any side, number of sides, and any size. So we can apply other kinds of function blocks and look at, for example, the max function. So the max function takes in two inputs and compares them and returns back the largest of the two. So this is a reporter because in this case we're returning back a value. That is the value that is the largest of the two parameters that are passed in. So as you look on the screen here, you'll see two parameters called val1 and val2. And the way that the logic is written here, we compare the two values. And whether val1 is smaller or val2 is smaller, we return back or we report back the specific value that is the smallest. So you look at the logic here, you can see there's a conditional if statement. And then we're reporting back the appropriate value. And then if you look at the program to the right, all that we're doing here is just writing to the screen which of those values is the smallest. So this particular report block returns a value. When we write software, especially software in a reusable way, and we create our own blocks, it's often useful to, to validate that the input parameters are correct. And in particular, that the, the parameters that are being passed to us are of the right types. So for example, it would be possible to pass in a, a variable in, in snap that's the wrong type. It can also be possible to pass in the right type but have a range of values that would be incorrect. For example, someone might pass in a, a date of birth that you know, has the wrong number of months or wrong number of days within a month. Or someone may pass in a credit card and it's an invalid credit card according to the Loon algorithm that we studied before. So often we have to validate our parameters. This can be done either on the call side from the whoever's calling our block can validate that before they call, or the block itself can do that. So there's all kinds of strategies, and we won't get into some of that, but just an example of how we would do that with the max function can be seen here. So in this case, before the max function even computes, it's checking to see whether or not the two parameters are actually numbers. So there is a facility in SNAP to check on the type of a parameter. In this case, we're asking whether or not both of those values coming in are numbers. And if so, then we can proceed with the typical max computation. Otherwise, we're returning a negative one. So this could be also a problem if we're trying to find the values and, and val1 or val2 are all, is also negative one. So we could do other things such as displaying some kind of error message or report back to the user in some fashion. But this just returns a negative one if the values passed in are of the wrong type. So you can see here on the screen how I might call this incorrectly. 
and would return a negative one instead of what you might expect in terms of comparing. It makes no sense to compare a character to a number. Here's another example of creating our own block that could be useful. For example, the less than or equal operator is not available in SNAP, but we can use the primitives already provided of the single less than and the single equal operator and combine them to create our own operator. And what's interesting about SNAP is we can place the parameters on the left side or the right side so that it looks like the operator is in the middle. We call this the infix notation. So in this case you can see what I've done with less than or equal is that I placed one value on the left as a parameter, one value on the right, and in the bottom left we have a conditional statement. So if it's the case that val1 is less than val2 or if they're equal, then we return true, otherwise we return false. A much more concise implementation, uh, maybe possibly even a little more clever implementation, would be just to report the Boolean value from this uh, logical expression. So you can see on the bottom right, this is just one line of code that does the same thing as less than or equal. So we have that compositional logical expression that will return a Boolean value of true or false, and we just simply return that back as a result of our block. So much of the focus of this lesson was about building custom blocks, not only how you build them procedurally, but the motivation for why. And the why is all about being able to reuse software. So in summary of this lesson, we can create our own blocks to simplify our own code and be able to achieve abstraction, which we'll talk about as we move on into other lessons. And these blocks can improve reusability. So for example, the draw shape block allows me to draw shapes of any size and any number of sides. So that's a very useful thing compared to just the initial square that draws a single square of 10 pixels. So in order to accomplish this generalizability, we can pass parameters into our blocks. And these parameters can abstract the essence of the things we would like to represent and allow us to reuse the software, as we just mentioned. So future activity that you might think about, you may see on one of the self quizzes or even an assessment, we'll give you some code in SNAP and we'll ask you to trace through that code, that block, and tell us what the block does. As a self exercise, and we won't be checking this in any way, but you might want to try this on your own, see if you can create a block called average that takes in a parameter that is a list of numbers and it returns back the average that's in that list. So this is a little bit challenging. You have to be able to loop over all the elements in the list, keep a running average, a running sum, and then be able to compute the average based on the number of elements in the list and report that back uh, to whoever called the block. So this is a report block that loops over a list, sums up the numbers in the list, and then returns the average.